Hello, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church here in Fayetteville, Tennessee, and we're glad to have you with us for this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But before we get into our study today, I do want to take just a moment to invite you to come and worship with us. Our church is located at 1015 Lewisburg Highway here in Fayetteville, and we have an 8.30 a.m. service. It's a little bit more casual in our fellowship hall. And then we have our 10.30 a.m. service here in the sanctuary. And it's a little bit more traditional. We would be delighted and overjoyed to have you come and worship with us uh, one Sunday morning. And give us a chance to get to know you a little bit better and you to get to know us a little bit better. Today I'm going to be talking about when Jesus called his very first disciples. And I'm going to be reading from the first chapter of Mark's gospel, beginning in verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As they went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and incline its hearing to our hearts and our minds and its application to our lives this day. We all have heard probably all our life and have experienced that timing is important. We know there are some things that we don't have to be in a rush to do and others have to be done immediately. We see all the time public, um, public uh, service commercials and ads uh, reminding us that if you have chest pain, you need to go to the hospital because it could be a heart attack. And we all know that minutes make all the difference in a case such as that. We know that sometimes speed or lack of speed can be the difference in success and failure. History is filled with many such examples, but one that came to my mind this week was uh, dealing with some of the events of the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Earlier, the month before, in November, the War Department had issued a war warning to all their posts in the Pacific Theater. They were all to be on high alert. But on the morning of December 7th in Washington, new intelligence and information began to come in and General Marshall, the Chief of Staff of the Army, felt like an additional warning was needed because they were beginning to feel something was imminent. They drafted such war warning, took it, have it sent, and normally it would have been transferred by radio. However, due to sunspots affecting the ionosphere, the radios were not working well that day, and so it was decided to send it by Western Union Telegram. Still, it would have gotten there fairly quickly if it had been marked urgent. However, for reasons lost to history, it was not marked urgent. And so there was some time before the message was actually transmitted. And even once arriving in Honolulu, it got put in with all the other dispatches and sadly did not arrive to military headquarters there on Oahu until well after the attack had begun. A lack of urgency made the difference, didn't it? If it had been sent immediately and arrived immediately or as close to immediately as can be, it could have made a difference. I guess we'll leave that to the historians to debate, but many of us have experienced something in our life where a lack of urgency cost either us or cost someone something that they had hoped to gain. Here in this story today, we see that Jesus is calling his first disciples. 
He is walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he encounters four men, Andrew, Peter, James, and John, all of which were fishermen that he calls to follow him. The thing that sticks out to me most in this story is not that they followed Jesus. I'm sure that, obviously, we could talk about and is important. But the greatest thing is that they followed Jesus immediately. There seems to have been no hesitation. No asking questions. No thinking about it and wondering what to do. They responded immediately. And I must say that it is hard for me, living at least in this 21st century, to imagine doing such a thing. To be able to leave everything behind to follow Christ. They left their job. They left the family business in the case of James and John. They would wind up leaving their family and friends behind. They left their hometown. They left their surroundings. They left everything that they knew and were comfortable with to follow Jesus. And they did not know where they were going, did they? They didn't know where they were going to go. They didn't know how long they would be gone. They didn't know what all was going to happen. They couldn't imagine the many miracles and great events they would see, nor could they imagine the horror of the cross that lay ahead. They could have never imagined that Jesus was going to prepare them to spread the new good news of the gospel throughout the world. These men that had never been probably but a few miles from their hometown would travel extensively throughout the world spreading the gospel message. Yet they don't ask any questions about it, do they? They leave immediately. And as we look at that today, I think we see that as a little bit uh, maybe irrational or not well thought out. I've often wondered what James and John's father, Zebedee, thought about it. After all, they were leaving the family business behind. It says here that they had hired men. That may not mean a lot to us, but it was a big deal in those days. And means they probably owned the boat themselves and probably were a little bit ahead of others. Yet, they walk off and leave him there. They leave that behind, don't they, to follow Christ. We rarely in our life make decisions on the spot. We try not to anyway. We are taught from when we are children that we need to take time to think about things before we do them. We need to think them through. We need to weigh our options. We don't need to act in a rash way or too quickly. And sometimes what that hesitation cost us is a blessing from God. Sometimes our hesitation, our delay, our thinking about it so much that we miss the opportunity that God is calling us to do. See, when it comes to us and our relationship with God, it is a matter of faith. We have to believe. These men not only believed, but they put that faith into action, didn't they? They left it all behind. Many of us today, if we were called by God to leave our homes, to leave our families, to leave our hometown, and go into the unknown as he is calling these men to do, we would hesitate and we would stop and we would begin to think about it. That's what a critical thinker would do. But sometimes that slows the Lord's work because what happens is we begin to think about it and we wind up thinking ourselves out of doing what God wants us to do. Look at these men. 
it would seem irrational for them to have been willing to leave their family, to leave their job, to leave their livelihoods, to leave their friends behind, to follow this teacher. Yet they do so in faith. And God is able to use them in a great and a tremendous way. God calls all of us. You may be sitting there and saying, well, God's never called me to do anything. God calls all people. First, he calls us to salvation. He calls us to believe, to have faith, to be changed and become that new creation through Jesus Christ. Sometimes we try to ignore that call like the other calls of God, but the Holy Spirit pulls at us and nags at us until hopefully we finally surrender to the Lord. But even after answering the call to salvation, there is still the call to service, the call to do the work of the Lord, the call to work in the church, to work in the community, to help shine the light of Christ into this dark age in which we live. And there is another call as well. What I'm going to term a spiritual call. A call to draw closer. A call to have a deeper and more meaningful relationship with our Savior. To pray more. To study more. To worship more. To draw closer and to focus our thoughts and our priorities more on the things of God. Instead of the outlook of this age. But when God calls us, how do we respond? Do we respond as Peter, Andrew, James, and John? Do we run for the opportunity to do it? Are we excited that God has called us? Are we tickled that this great and awesome God that we love and serve or at least we say we love and serve, is willing and wanting to use us in his work. Rarely, rarely do we do that. Most of the time we wish the Lord had not interrupted our day. We wish he had called someone else, maybe the preacher, maybe one of the elders or deacons, maybe someone else, more qualified than ourselves, in our mind at least. See, we come up with a lot of reasons why the Lord cannot use us. And we come up with a lot of reasons why we do not need to answer the call of God. Now, I don't believe that there are many of us. There may be a few. But I think we've been around church and religion enough to know that you don't just say no to God. I'm sure there are some that feel the call of God and just say, no, I'm not going to do it. But I think that would be a small number because we know that's wrong. I mean, you don't have to think very long about that to figure out if God's calling you, he wants you to do it. And this is God after all. We need to listen. But what we do is, see, we hesitate. And we begin to think about it. And we begin to come up with a lot of justifications in our own mind. A lot of reasons. Some might even say excuses. Why we can't do it. Look at these men. Did they have any possible justifications of not immediately answering the call of Christ? Well, from God's perspective, of course, no. And neither do we. But from the human perspective, they do. They could have said, hey, I'd like to go with you, Jesus. Wait till I get off work and I'll catch up with you tonight. Jesus, this is the busy time of the season for the business. Can you wait a few days or weeks and then I'll go with you? Let me get somebody trained here to help my father. They could have talked about their many family commitments. We don't know about Zebedee. Maybe they felt like they needed to stay with him. Peter 
We don't know very much about his family, but we do read later where Jesus heals his mother-in-law. So we assume then he has a wife. Maybe he could have said, I can't be away from my family. I've got too many family commitments. I've got too many work commitments. They could have talked about how, Jesus, I'm not the one you want. I can't read nor write. I don't have any education. I've never traveled more than a few miles from my home. I wouldn't be any help to you. You need to go to Jerusalem and get some of them to help you. Some of those Pharisees and Sadducees that have been educated in the law of Moses and in the scripture. But Jesus called them, didn't he? And there is a reason that Jesus called them. And that is that they are the ones he intended to use. And that he wanted to use. And when God calls us, it is the same way. God calls us because we're the one he wants to do it. A lot of times we say, well, you should have called somebody else, Jesus. Well... He's calling us. We should be honored that he's given us that opportunity to serve. And for all we know, he's already called everybody else and they said no. It doesn't matter though it, what he's doing with other people. It only matters what we're doing and what our relationship with God is. And when he is calling us to serve, there is but one answer. And that is yes. And there is only one time to do it. And that is now, not tomorrow, not later on. If God is calling us to do something, he's calling us to do it now, not 10 years from now, not a month from now. He's calling us now. So many times we delay and we say, oh, when I retire, Lord, then I'll be able to serve you more. Or we say, oh, Lord, when things slow down. When the kids are older and not involved in so many things, then I'll do it. But the Lord is calling us today. He is calling us now because the need is now. The need may or may not be there tomorrow, but the need is there today to serve him. And we need to answer that call. All the time I see on social media somebody posting uh, a statement about how the plan of God is always perfect. We can trust the plan of God because it's perfect. Or the timing of God is always just right. I'm sure you have seen such things or heard such things said. And we could, most of us could probably agree that for a large part, we agree with that sentiment. But I've noticed that when it comes to God, God calling us to make a change in our life, we're not so sure how perfect his plan is. And when he is calling us to do something today, we're not so sure how good his timing is. See, God's plan is perfect in our mind. God's First, God's plan is perfect anyway. But God's plan is, on, is perfect in our mind only as long as God's plan is what we expect and what our plan is to start with. And when he starts to call us to make a change, to get out of our comfort zone, challenges what our plans and our timing and our goals and outlook for our life is, then we are not so sure that God's plan is really right. We go back and say, God, are you sure? God, do you really know what you're doing? We start asking a hundred questions. It's amazing to me that these four men, the very first disciples called by Christ, they waste no time asking a bunch of questions. I don't know how they did it. I've got to be honest with you. I would be there with you and ask them a hundred questions. 
Where are we going? Where are we going to sleep? Where are we going to stay? How are we going to have food? How are we going to make a living? How long are we going to be gone? What's going to happen? What should I expect to happen? They had a trust in God and Jesus that it would be taken care of. And that is what we have to have as well. As hard as it is, we must put those doubts aside. And we must go forward with the Lord. And when he calls us, there is but one answer. And that is yes. And when he calls us, there is but one time to do it. And that is now. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we come before you this day, we do thank you that you are a God that loves us. You're a God that cares for us. And that you do have a great plan and purpose for our life, for the human race, and for the world. We thank you that you are willing to use us in your cause, even though we often doubt and we sin, we make mistakes, we lack faith, and we ask forgiveness, Lord, for that and the other times that we have not responded positively. To your direction in our life. Forgive us our sins Lord. And take us and use us. For your kingdom's work. We pray today for all those that are suffering. Especially those that are sick. And those that are grieving. As we continue to go through this pandemic Lord. We pray that you would guide our leaders. And the medical professionals. Give them wisdom. As how to best to proceed. And may this calamity, this plague, soon pass from us, Lord. And may we as a people and as your children be strengthened for enduring it all. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior. Amen. I do again want to invite you to come and worship with us. We're located here at 1015 Lewisburg Highway here in Fayetteville, Tennessee at the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We have our traditional worship service here in the sanctuary at 1030. And then we have our uh, a little bit more casual service at 830 a.m. on Sunday mornings in the Fellowship Hall. And again, may God bless each and every one of you. May he keep you safe this week and be with you.